uh, from the people that are, are uh, here already tonight, if, have you already heard, have you heard of pain reprocessing therapy? And you can put a yes or a no or a kind of in the chat box. No, no. Okay, no. All right. Okay, not really and no. All right, <laughs> a little bit, somewhat, yeah. Okay, well, that's that's, uh, that's good to know. Yeah. And if you've taken the reframe pain course, um, you'll kind of know a little bit about what Jen's going to talk about. Um, it's based on pain reprocessing therapy, although we don't really explicitly say that. Um, but yeah. Hey, hi there. Hello. 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 On camera hey. here. There we go. Great. Hi. Hello. Hi, Jen. Hello. How are you okay, doing? So... Good, thanks. Good. We're thanks for at joining us. Six. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll dive right in. Um, maybe I'll just stop. Stop the share so we can see all of us and I am recording. Um, great. Okay. Welcome everybody. I'll turn it over to uh, Mark from the pain clinic just to get us uh, going tonight in uh, tonight's great. webinar. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome to everybody and thank you uh, for joining us and a uh, special thanks to Jen Medvedu for joining us to talk about pain reprocessing therapy. Um, we like to have a number of guests periodically uh, on the on the webinars for interesting topics that are you know relevant to our pain patients. So it's uh, it's really great of you to join us, Jen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, for yeah, and just uh, to everybody joining us, just um, you can sometimes put things in the chat. We'll do our best to kind of look and address them. Um, there, you know, just we ask that if you um, do put anything in there, just to treat everything confidential uh, with confidentiality so that people feel comfortable making comments. Sometimes they might share something or ask something of very personal nature. So that's all we ask. So yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Madeline and Jen. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm really excited for tonight's uh, talk with Jen Medwidu. We're, we're very fortunate to have her, uh, well, locally, where, where we are um, in Kelowna as, um, as a clinical therapist. And um, she's a, a clinical trauma um, therapist um, as well as done, has uh, done, I, I see you've done the compassionate inquiry training with mm -hmm. Gab, Dr. Gabor Mate. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a good one. Um, and, and the interesting thing about Jan is she actually was a clinical, she was a pharmacist for 15 years before uh, becoming a counselor. So it's, kind of, it's a very interesting um, transition. I, and I imagine that was a big shift from like the, the medical interventions, 100%, to being a therapist. And, um, and which le has led her into the area of uh, also of, of chronic pain and pain reprocessing therapy. So, um, I was saying earlier that some of you, if you've taken the reframe pain course that Mark and I have done, it's based on PRT. Um, but tonight we get to dive into a little bit more. I, I think Jen's going to be able to explain it a little bit better than I have ever been able to. So um, welcome, Jen. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious about how you came to, uh, it's a fairly new approach to chronic pain and how, how you came to be trained in PRT. 
Yeah, it was actually through a client. Um, she had seen her massage therapist and the massage therapist recommended Alan Gordon's book, The Way Out. And so my client told me about it. And to be honest, my initial reaction was, oh, great, another another chronic pain book. <laughs> and um, right. I thought, well, I'll check it out. And it was really intriguing. So I, I read it and was very excited at the prospect of not just learning to cope with chronic pain, but the possibility of decreasing it or eliminating it. So then I went to his website and um, was excited to see training. And so jumped right on that. That was about a year and a half ago. Okay. And it's very quickly become a big part of my practice. Wow. So you must be one of the first people to get trained in it then. I'm just thinking because it only really came out like beginning of last year or almost. Yeah, I think I was maybe in the second cohort. It was pretty early on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, if, have, if any of you haven't, I know some of you have read the book, um, The Way Out by Alan Gordon. It's, it's worth the read as well as watching some of his videos on YouTube are, are pretty, pretty incredible too. Um, but I, I just love how you said like, you know, oh great, you know, another, another approach to chronic pain. Cause I think that's what a lot of people have felt like, okay, here's another thing, you know, that uh, another thing to know or another thing to try. Um, but you were kind of intrigued by that possibility uh, of it being like, really reduced or even eliminated mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah and and i think um you know we've had dr howard schubiner on here before too and he i think he was part of the oh, cool. original group that he, yeah i've interviewed him yeah. that oh, that yeah. created it yeah yeah way back when and and also i'll put i'll just make a a a, a plug for the the app curable yeah yes it's also based on prt Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think y'all really want to know what does what does PRT treatment involve? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think um, before I answer that, maybe I should just clarify what type of pain PRT addresses. Yes. Um, I know you guys probably know a lot of this, but just a refresher. Um, there's generally two different types of pain. Um, so the first one being structural when there's something physically wrong in the body. So if you've broken a bone or sprained an ankle, um, that would be structural pain. And PRT mostly works with neuroplastic pain, which is when the pain is very real, but it is originating in the brain as opposed to in the body. Um, and that is what the majority of chronic pain is, usually the neuroplastic pain. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, PRT is kind of a collection of psychological methods as opposed to physical interventions to deal with the pain, and it helps to retrain the brain and break that, that chronic pain cycle. Um, so it looks different for everyone. Um, there isn't just a set sort of rigid approach, but in general it involves, um, usually first we look at the client's um, individual pain history and health history and create their own evidence list um, for it being neuroplastic pain. Um, we then try and retrain the brain um, just to reappraise those sensations of pain mm -hmm. um, through a new lens of safety. And that is usually through mindful mindfulness activities. Um, he calls it somatic tracking. Um, we also deal with a lot of the underlying emotional issues in their lives that might be contributing to the pain mm -hmm. unknowingly. Um, we do a lot of addressing the negative emotions that go along with the pain, um, like fear or frustration. And then it's also really important we um, learn how to gravitate towards 
um, positive emotions and positive body sensations, which can be really difficult for people living with chronic pain. Um, a lot of it becomes very negative in their lives. So those are kind of the right. basic aspects of it in a nutshell. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That makes a, I, the part that I'm, um, I'm curious about is uh, the evidence list. And, and uh, mm. so is that like um, <clears throat> delving into what would make it possibly neuroplastic as opposed to something damaging going on in the body? Yeah. Um, yeah. So some things that might make it more likely to be neuroplastic is if the pain originated without an injury, but having an injury doesn't mean it's not neuroplastic. Sometimes it starts out as structural and then um, turns into neuroplastic. Um, right. Certain personality characteristics, um, people don't always <laughs> like this part, but yeah, if you have a people pleasing tendency. Um, if you're really self critical, um, prone to anxiety, I actually see that as good news because it, it usually is a is a check mark in the direction of neuroplastic pain. Um, if yeah. you've been through childhood trauma, um, if your symptoms shift or move or change in intensity, that's usually a sign towards neuroplastic pain. Right. Yeah, yeah. In the reframe pain uh, course that um, some some of you guys have taken it, we we do a week on uh, personality patterns mm. and how they might unwittingly be be contributing to pain. It, it's one of my my favorite weeks, and it's it can also be right. Like it can be a little confronting. Like, oh, <laughs> but I, we don't know we're doing this. Yeah. Like, we, I mean, we we might know, but we we. It's I think it's so cool that these things are being connected because it's something that we can change, you know, uh, that we, I see someone stand up a little <laughs> laughing emoji. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the underlying um, emotions that who would have known all these years that these underlying emotions would be contributing so much to, to mm -hmm. our pain. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's borne out in the evidence, isn't it? Uh, with the boulder back pain study yeah where it, it really showed to be effective yeah yeah so so cool um so so there's a question i'll just uh is emdr a technique associated with prt yeah i um, i would say it's not it's not part of prt but if you um if you have trauma, that might be part of the reason for your pain. EMDR might be a part of the treatment plan kind of indirectly. I'm not trained in EMDR myself, but I do a different form of trauma processing. And there was somebody with um, pelvic floor pain that had experienced trauma. And that's been a big part of her healing process is the okay. trauma processing. Right. And that makes sense too, hey, to release the under, again, like the underlying emotions underneath the pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, did you wanna jump in there, Mark, around anything? Or? No, I just, I think, you know, there's there's a role for both, um, you know, I, you could probably speak more to it since that you were one of the first people I know to be trained in EMDR. Long time um, ago. <laughs> long time ago, yeah, you have a lot of experience in that area. So, yeah, I think there's, you know, I, th I think with chronic pain, it it really behoves us to think that we need, you know, several different tools for, for different people in different situations, you know. Mm -hmm. um, some people respond better to some things than others. So I, I think it's always useful to have a repertoire of tools and, and at least be aware of what some of the other modalities are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so can you use uh, PRT if, if you actually have structural pain? Yeah, yes, you can. Um, so usually with any type of pain, there's some emotional component to it, some sort of fear involved. 
or frustration, whatever the case may be. Um, and you may, with structural pain, we're not really trying to get the pain down to a zero, but usually there can be a bit of a reduction in pain. Mm. And I have some colleagues who are working with clients with cancer pain and using PRT, they got the pain levels from say an eight out of 10 down to like a four out of 10. So it's possible um, to decrease it. Right. Oh, the, and that makes sense too, when you have pain, like you're going to have the fear and the frustration, whether it's cancer related or it's neuroplastic, um, to be able to just kind of take it down. I know when I've had like severe back pain, talking my way through the fear was probably the, the biggest like back pain reducer. <laughs> and then you're left with the structural problem. Right. right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, this, this role of fear and the negative emotions in pain, it seems to be a big part of it that mm -hmm. from what we've noticed and just, you know, what, yeah, from PRT, can you tell us about that role of fear? Yeah. So in PRT, they call it the pain fear cycle. So pain essentially equals a sensation. Um, plus the emotion of fear when the brain interprets that sensation as dangerous. Um, I think one of the best examples is um, the story of the construction worker. And I think this may have been in his book, but um, there was a construction worker and on the job site, he jumped on one of those really long nails by accident and the nail went all the way through his boot he was in such excruciating pain on the way um, to the hospital that they, they had to sedate him in the ambulance. And when the doctor was treating him, they pulled out the nail, they removed the boot, and there was actually no injury. Um, the nail had gone right between his toes and his brain had interpreted the, the visual along with the sensation of the cold nail going between his toes as danger. And he responded with very real pain. Um, so that's just a really classic example of how the brain <laughs> gets involved and the fear can amplify or create pain entirely. Um, right. And yeah, when we think about chronic pain, I just want to acknowledge that, of course, there's negative emotions, of course, there's fear and frustration and um, nobody wants to be, nobody wants to be in pain. And um, that being said, it's important to address those emotions, because um, they unintentionally can be increasing or prolonging, prolonging the pain. So uh, with PRT, we counteract that with focusing on safety and specifically in neuroplastic pain, really leaning into um, the fact that there isn't anything structurally wrong in the body and that can really help to decrease those fear reactions. Right. And, and you know, I think that right there, yeah, that's such a good example of a construction worker, like, but he was in agony. He had to be sedated and no construction worker goes off the site in an ambulance unless they're really in trouble. Right. And, and so just his, just the visual of seeing it go through his boot created this pain in, in his body. It was real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so how the fear can, can create, I'm thinking about, you know, kids when they fall down in a playground and they get pick themselves up and they're okay and they run off. And then they see a whole pile of blood <laughs> and all of a sudden they have a ton of pain. Like it's, and it's such a, like a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so PRT, it sounds like is able to kind of unravel that a little bit and like untangle that fear that, like you said, like just acknowledging that there's going to be fear and negative emotions with pain. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. you know, it's kind of part of the, part of the, the ex experience, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, a good way to, and, and yeah, and frustration and um, all those other um, 
Yeah. So you mentioned at the end, like um, what you, I think, did you say like a big part of it was kind of leaning into safety? Yeah. Focusing on, on safety within the body or in your life, just the opposite of what those danger signals are. Right. Okay. And, oh yes, I know what I wanted to, the, to comment on. The last thing you said was just for, um, Probably the hardest part for people with pain to really realize is that last part that in chronic pain, there's nothing structurally, sometimes there is, but wrong with the body, like damaging in the body. That's a hard thing to, to download that Mark and I talk about quite a bit um, mm -hmm. when you're in, when your body keeps telling you that you, that there is something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. a hard one. Absolutely. So when you're using um, PRT with someone, how, how long do you th does it usually take? Like in your experience, how long does it take to treat yeah. chronic pain? Yeah, it really, really depends on the person. Um, I've had clients that have had pretty significant pain and all they had to do was learn about neuroplastic pain and read Alan Gordon's book and my work was done. <laughs> they didn't need yes. any PRT. Um, some people have a lot of underlying emotional issues and trauma, like I mentioned. So that might take several months. Um, I think usually within a couple sessions, um, people at least get some decrease in their pain levels. Okay. So, yeah. Depends, but yeah, quite, yeah, quite varied. <laughs> and you know, I've also found that too. And I, you know, if there's anybody here that even wants to comment on that, um, that that learning of, about pain, about uh, neuroplastic pain, is such an important part of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, like some people, and I think the research even shows that when they learn that, oh my goodness this is not, this is not my fault. And like my nervous system is working overtime. Like it seems mm -hmm. like that right there can kind of calm and mm -hmm. relax the nervous system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I just want to say, David, David says it's a very difficult spot to be in. I assure you. Yes. You perhaps then feel guilty thinking somehow this is your doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's um, that somehow, again, like I've seen people say, what? Like, it's not my fault. It's not something I'm doing or not doing or, and then there's no more guilt or shame around it. It's, yeah. Yeah. And then there's the people that um, maybe are not believed about their pain or kind of told that it's maybe in their head with, I would explaining <laughs> it's it is in your head it's your brain <laughs> and right. there's something you can do about it then they they oh yeah we know we've never heard that before in this group <laughs> ever nobody <laughs> i'm, I'm yeah. just totally being sarcastic because that's a big yeah. part of it yeah. yeah sorry go ahead yeah, it's, yeah. Ju it's just it's sad that um that it's i mean it's i guess it's becoming more well known but um hopefully this will become the main treatment model for chronic pain at some point absolutely yeah i mean mark you you and i've heard that a lot just you know and for um you know, the people here you know if you've been told like that it's all in your head or you know your brain mm. is causing it or um you know or the medical system saying i'm sorry there's nothing more that we can do you know we've heard that before and it's it's that in itself can be traumatizing i think Oh, absolutely. I, I think, you know, we've heard that so many times that uh, patients feel they haven't been heard or understood. Um, and I think we're, we're actually poorly trained to really understand what happens in chronic pain. We're very good at managing acute pain, but chronic pain is, is way more challenging. Um, and, and I think uh, as physicians, we, we don't do a particularly good job all the time, you know. So, unless you've got a real interest in it and uh, and want to explore it uh, in terms of your own self-learning and education it, it is quite challenging 
-hmm. and yeah, in the busy physician office. Um, it's, you know, if you can't come up with something quickly, then um, it's like, yeah, I can't do much about this, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's, it's not structured in a way that, that lends itself to helping patients with complex chronic pain. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I know we've heard, you know, the stories about people just, yeah, yeah not just not mm -hmm. being believed that they they have pain um, or that their pain is real. And I think what you're saying, Jen, is that, yeah, like even though it comes, you know, might originate in the brain and the spinal cord, it's just as real as it is because it's still, it's still pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, Jesse's just commenting, I've had an un unexpected and positive change from these classes, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Eleanor Stein, neuroplasticity view, like just the whole idea of neuroplasticity um, can be so, uh, so enlightening. So, yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm really curious what types of pain um, you have seen um, that you've treated with pain reprocessing therapy and and just what kind of results you've seen in in your own office? Yeah, um, I've worked with a lot with migraines, a lot of back and neck neck pain, um, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, the pelvic floor pain that I mentioned. Um, and I've even worked with um, things like chronic fatigue and vertigo. So in PRT, um, things like nausea, dizziness, fatigue, those can all be conceptualized as danger signals, um, just like pain. So the same principles are used. Um, and uh, yeah, I've seen some really incredible things and it's very exciting when you get to see somebody get out of pain. Um, I worked with a woman a little while ago and she was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease and had some bone spurs on some of her discs and she was functioning at a eight out of ten pain almost every day and her physiotherapist I believe suggested that <laughs> delicately that she may check out the um, link between mind body connection and pain and right, that can be a delicate link sometimes hey yeah with, with people it can yeah. be a jump yeah yeah so she reached out and after four or five sessions she has no pain and it's really incredible because this has been years and she's tried everything as i'm sure all of you have that's so it, it it's so incredible to hear that. And I'm sure it's so hopeful for, for so many people um, that when you've got the pain and then the fear, when you reduce the, the fear, like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm left with this. You can see this, you know, significant reduction, you know, like you said, within sometimes within a few sessions. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So you mentioned something earlier that I'm, I'm wondering if you could, uh, you know, even, I don't know if you want to demonstrate or just tell us a bit more about somatic tracking. Yeah, so um, essentially it is um, a bit of a meditation where, and there is no official structure to it, um, but there is some just general principles. So it's trying, and I, I should clarify, this is only really done when your pain is at say a five out of 10 or less. So we don't wanna do this when the pain is six or higher, cause it's really difficult for the brain to take in those messages of safety. Right. So you're dealing with medium to lower pain. It's trying to just take a stance of curiosity, mindfully observing the pain, um, just watching it for any shifting movement, change in intensity. Um, and, and we send, we call it sending messages of safety to the brain um, while we're doing this. And it's the combination of observing it um, and focusing on the safety at the same time that oh, okay. can, 
it doesn't always shift the pain in the moment, but practiced over time, it's the neuroplasticity, it's the repetition of associating, observing the pain without the fear and focusing on the safety that starts to create those new pathways in the brain. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm getting a sort of an image of being able to sort of observe the pain here as it's like shifting and changing as like part of the sensations in your life. And maybe there's also a sensation of safety over here at the same time. And what a, like, that's a profound shift for someone who's like completely overwhelmed with pain that you mm -hmm. know, can be really natural to be to be able to kind of separate it and notice it. Yeah, and to hold those two things at the same time, both the sensations of pain and the, the safety. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those of you that uh, are interested in like that idea of somatic tracking, it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, Juliet has some classes uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and she does some somatic work like that through through the clinic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that somatic being able to track somatic soma meaning body, what's happening in the body. Yeah, there was another tool that you mentioned. Was there another tool in CRT? Is somatic tracking? Oh, leaning into safety. Yeah, and, and positive sensations, um, positive or neutral, it can just be like focusing on the breath or just the feeling of sunlight <laughs> if you're sitting outside, smelling the fresh air, just things that leaning into those things in your life that might go unnoticed if you're in pain all the time. Right. And they, they seem like, you know, small things, but they're not actually small things, are they, mm -hmm. to like to actually notice the, the sun or your breath or, yeah, like those safe things. Yeah. yeah, and if you can start to draw your attention to them, you do start to notice them more and you can yeah, make that a bigger part of your day than it has been. Right, yeah. I, I remember, I'm remembering someone who used to, when they were in a lot of pain, um, you know, and just kind of gets very consumed with it as the, as the, the threat, as the danger, um, just starting to look up at the sky more and more often, just like really simple. And even if the pain was overwhelming, just still like looking at the sky and, and that created, that started to become more natural to look away from the pain. So would, would you say that's like, that's like forming a new neural pathway, really? Yeah, absolutely. And um, another example, just leaning into those positives is intentionally seeking out movies, TV shows, podcasts, things that will make you laugh or induce positive emotions. Because um, that's another thing that can unintentionally keep that fear pain cycle going is yeah we all love our our adrenaline tv but um it it can really activate those pathways um even if it's not related to the pain so i encourage people to at least find something in their life that makes them laugh and brings them a bit of joy well i'm gonna i'm gonna vote for ted lasso this week. I haven't watched that. <laughs> you haven't watched Ted Lasso? Oh, oh. Like, I think it's good pain management. <laughs> okay. Good yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a, a question here. Uh, what specifically has had the most success rate in PRT? Um, oh, like what part are you saying, Rosemary? Like what part of PRT? Is it a, a mantra repeated each time the pain increases? Yeah, what would you say would be have been like the most powerful part that your clients have mm -hmm. taken from PRT? Yeah, interestingly, it's yeah, I would I would say mantras play a large a large role. Um, that and maybe just taking 
really taking a hard look at their lives and seeing, looking for things that um, Alan Gordon calls it keeping the brain on high alert. So um, are there things that you can reduce or eliminate from your life in the, in the name of healing your pain? Um, that would fall under addressing these underlying emotional um, issues. And that seems to create a big shift when people feel empowered to make these changes that will, will help with the pain. That's, that's, that's huge, what, what you just said. Yeah. Because I, I think for so long, we've been looking to the pain clinic and, and to doctors and for medication and, and injections and to help to some, to some degree, they do. But then that shift towards, okay, what can I do in my daily life that, that's creating danger for me, whether it's you know, a, a friendship that's really stressful or are those the types of things you mean or just watching the news every night or anything yes. that's kind of like charging, <laughs> charging up your nervous system. Yeah, yeah, it depends. I don't know if, if somehow the news is relaxing to you. Yeah, go for it. But most people, I suggest <laughs> taking out the news. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting you mentioned the friendship that might be stressful. So sometimes people just need to set some boundaries um, with family members or friends that once they start to set those and honor them, like their body kind of relaxes and their pain decreases. Um, some people need to make some work changes and I can appreciate not everybody can change jobs or change what they do for work, but if it's possible um, and it's contributing to your daily stress, it might be necessary to decrease your pain. Uh, yeah. You may not like often think of these things, but as you're saying it, like it, it makes so much sense. If you're always worried like that the phone will ring because that family member is going to call you and you really don't want to talk to them, um, uh, you know, I, you can feel how the nervous system mm -hmm. would be on alert all the time mm -hmm. yeah. or going into work every day and you've got that boss that, yeah, that's difficult. That's... Mm -hmm pain management. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Ada says uh, making sleep a priority um, because the insomniac days only make everything worse. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like those, those shifts, those changes around like sleep hygiene, um, doing the best you can, you know, to get a good night's sleep. Yeah. So it sounds like sort of almost, um, what, what did uh, Alan Gordon ta call it? Like just kind of taking stock of, of your life and looking through and seeing what creates fear or that, you know, agitation or frustration. Yes, anxiety, yeah, anything that keeps the brain on high alert. Um, trying to think of some other examples, but it'll come to hmm. me. Yeah. Because fear takes many forms too. It sounds like you've said like frustration, anxiety. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Worry. Yeah, and the, sometimes it's grief work. Some people, it, I mean, understandably, nobody really wants to, to go through the grieving process. It's not pleasant, but I've had a lot of clients that have maybe grief that they've never touched on and that I truly believe just comes out as physical pain if you don't deal with the emotional pain. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, yeah. So, so have I. We haven't really, unfortunately, been trained very well how to really feel our our emotions and express them and and release them. Mm -hmm. And I think gr grief is is a big one. Yeah. It's, we haven't always been able to just grieve publicly or with other people. Um, yeah, until we actually release it. So that, that again, like is, is really, I think, borne out in the research as well. Like just sit around, um, I don't know if anybody here uses like automatic writing or like um, expressive writing uh, to, exp is that not part of PRT, is it? 
Um, not, not specifically, but I think on the Curable app, they have a lot of uh, journaling prompts and okay. things for writing, writing out your emotions. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just to kind of release that charge underneath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Isa, um, a question back there about, uh, okay. Jody says I, I found reducing stressors to be incredibly valuable turning down the high alert signals, um, move to teaching older elementary students, stopped watching the news, especially during COVID and stopped hosting international students. They cause a lot of drama. <laughs> Raising someone else's teen was becoming too much. I can totally, well, I think that's good pain management, Jody, 100%. Yeah. Uh, so a question about how do you go about dealing with the old traumas? Um, and another question about EMDR. Do you use EMDR um, at all? Um, yeah, how would you yeah, not. I, I, it's on my uh, long term to do list to do EMDR training. Um, I've done training in um, tapping or the emotional freedom technique. They have a specific trauma processing um, format. So that's usually what I use with people if it's a specific single incident trauma. Um, some people have that complex childhood trauma, which is a little more drawn out, um, parts work, internal family system style. Um, right. You know, I would love to, and I'm, I'm gonna ask the audience too, if they're, they would be interested in, uh, I would love to have you back, Jen, to, um, talk about EFT, about tapping, okay. and perhaps do some tapping with us. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, because I, a few people have asked me, uh, just as agreed, yeah, I, a few people have asked me about, about tapping for trauma that underlies uh, chronic pain. So I think we're gonna have to make that another, another class. Yeah, lots of, mm -hmm. lots of yes, please. Tapping itself, can help pain in the moment. Um, there's even a pain protocol for tapping, so we could play around with that in a in a session. Yeah. Okay, that would be that would be awesome. Um, yeah. So, Mark, I would say definitely uh, dealing with old trauma is very useful in in chronic pain. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We've, and, and besides tapping, we've also had some interesting uh, work with drumming, remember? That was also... Uh, right. Yeah. I forgot all that was about really that. Good. Yeah. yeah. We had yeah. A, a drumming class one Monday night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like drumming for pain, which is kind of, yeah, that beat. Mm -hmm. Kind of cross between tapping and EMDR, mm -hmm. I think. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so many, yeah. so many ways. But thanks for drawing attention to the, how important... Um, that is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just for our patients, uh, um, looking at different ways of, of turning down the volume of the pain, you know, um, you might not turn it off, but at least turning it down so it's more manageable is really important. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, question is tapping like specific breath work? Um, it's, oh, that's a good question. Is it a pattern to distract your brain? Yeah, so it's, it's actually uses the principles of acupuncture. Um, so it's tapping on points. So there's no needles, which is nice. Um, and we tap on a certain series of points. Um, and as we're doing this, we're focusing on the negative things. So the negative emotions or the pain. And what happens, um, this has been really well studied, what happens in the body when you're tapping is your cortisol levels decrease. So your stress hormones decrease. Um, the amygdala in the brain, which is that emotional fire alarm, that activity decreases. So it's, I guess, kind of like somatic tracking in that you're holding this calming um, method while focusing on the pain or the negative emotions and that holding of both kind of sends the brain a signal like, okay, things, 
things are okay. And when it's specifically used for trauma, they don't really know how or why, but it, it does the same thing similar to EMDR in that there's the memory reconsolidation. So it gets stored properly in the brain. So it's mm -hmm. never going to be a good memory, but we've kind of let go of the traumatic emotions that go around that surround it. Right. Okay. Yeah. That sounds this this whole idea about holding, you know, two sets of emotions at the same time, like a, the the pain or the negative experience, and also something positive, at mm -hmm. the same time. It's um, it sounds really important for for pain and for humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know. Um, yeah, I was thinking about uh, the you know emotional freedom in in pain. The idea of having conflicting emotions at the same time um, really seems to resonate with people a lot. Like, uh, um, yeah, like Wanda, where does guilt fit in? Like, I just, you know, when I'm thinking about conflicting emotions, you can have guilt and you can have relief at the same time. For example, setting a boundary, you can feel guilty about it, but you can also have an incredible amount of, of relief mm -hmm. um, at the same time. Um, yes yes yeah do you have uh any any input like where does guilt fit in 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 terms of chronic pain or is it just another one of those like negative emotions that we need just need to kind of sift through um yeah i guess it depends on where the guilt is originating um say for example um you feel really guilty whenever you do self-care and you're taking time away from your family to look after yourself that's kind of a problem when it comes to pain because you need to look after yourself so i guess we would probably look at where the guilt's coming from um i just read a really great book on boundaries um called set boundaries find peace by nedra glover tawab and she talks about the guilt around setting boundaries and how she's like, yeah, so what? You're gonna feel guilty. It's a normal human emotion and you will get through it and you're gonna feel so much better after you set those boundaries and it's just part of it. So yeah, right. building in some acceptance around feeling guilty. Right, and not trying to get out of the guilt. Like that, mm -hmm. that's- Be with it and get through. Yeah. That, that's such a good point because the guilt is what keeps us from setting the boundary. I'm just thinking like, we don't want to feel guilty. So we don't set the boundary right. because when we set the boundary, we feel guilty, but um, yeah. So expect it, Ex expect it. It's going to happen and you'll survive it. Right. Yeah. What you're saying like to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so would love a class on that. Uh, yeah, it does too. And this somatic tracking, when you're doing breath work, you're not necessarily replacing a negative emotions with positive thoughts. Yes, there was a set of classes, um, Ina, uh, well, on, on reframing pain and somatic tracking. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to dig those up. Yeah. Setting boundaries is loving oneself, right? And that is uh, good medicine for pain to, to move to loving yourself and, and not being too hard on yourself and criticizing yourself. I just remembered something too about somatic tracking. Sometimes if it's, if it's too much, like the pain is too high, sometimes we do the somatic tracking for the negative emotions around the pain. Um, like the anxiety about the pain, the fear, because emotions, we can usually feel those somewhere in our body. And we've also kind of learned to, to fear them. Um, they mm -hmm. shouldn't be there. But if we can kind of just curiously observe the emotions too, that can, that can help with the pain. And okay. I've, I've recorded a somatic tracking from my clients that I send, and I've been meaning to just put it on my website. So um, I think I'll post that under um, client resources. So 
if anybody okay. wants to just do a experience what it what it's like that'd be fantastic put that up there today so that's fantastic and so if i'm having like a high pain day and it's not a day for me to do somatic tracking and so an alternative would be for for me to just start to notice like the anger or the yeah. sadness instead yeah and, and instead of focusing on the pain like where do you feel like say the anger is in your chest we would explore the, what that sensation feels like and just take that stance of curiosity and still send those messages of safety keeping in mind it's it's just a normal human emotion I, I really like that uh, you mm -hmm. know and I, I maybe it's helpful for for you guys that are here tonight for those those days where you're you're really having a hard time to really just notice what are the emotions that are here and tracking them in your body mm -hmm. seeing where they land and right there like you're just already bringing some care towards yourself mm -hmm. yeah i love that well, we're coming to the end. I just want to check, um, is somatic tracking synonymous with PRT? And now it's a part of PRT, isn't it? But it's somatic tracking is a tool in itself. Yeah, it's a tool used in PRT, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is we've got somatic tracking um, and leaning towards uh, positive or pleasurable safe sensations. Mm -hmm. um and being able to kind of hold them both at at the same time is a really core part of of pain reprocessing therapy mm -hmm. yeah yeah awesome so jen what is your how do people get a hold of you if they're interested in in doing mm -hmm. some because there are not too many practitioners in canada I think you and I are like, I, I train as well, but I, I don't really use it because I don't do a lot of individual, I do do some individual work where, where I do use it, but uh, not, not to the level that you do. Um, there's not a lot of people. So how do people get a hold of you? Do you want me to drop my website in the chat? Yeah, is it, is it or I can, Mission is it Mission View Counseling? Yeah, Mission View Counseling. Um, I've got a page on there about PRT. Um, and so, yeah, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Missionviewcounseling.com? Yeah. Okay. Whoopsie. It's a little M. I can cut and paste if that's easier for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Oh, you get it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah missionviewcounseling.com so so very very interesting and where i first learned about prt was when i ran across um I'll, i'm going to write it in here but the boulder back pain study and i was uh blown away by the results of that study and then dove into reading about it and found out that it was actually prt that they were using mm. in that study. I think Alan Gordon actually did that study. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did he? Yeah. 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 And I'm just gonna put his book that you mentioned, okay. The Way Out. Yeah. I saw somebody asking if we can do this work remotely. And yeah, a lot of a lot of my clients are remote throughout BC. So pretty much the same as in person. And um, all, of, all the principles of PRT are, are in that book that you just <laughs> put in the chat. And um, some people can do it all on their own. And sometimes it just needs, you need that extra person to help you work through some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's fantastic. I love these things that are coming out that are, that just shows, um, that people can do it's it's really nice to have the support of someone or the clinic or you but they are like self practices that we can do on our own whether it's tapping or a somatic tracking um it's really empowering i think 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, empowering, that's a good word. Yeah, so um, we're definitely gonna have you back for EFT, because I really <laughs> wanna get to some tapping. Um, but uh, yeah, Mark, do you have anything uh, to ask or anything to say before we say goodbye to Jen for the night? Well, uh, no, just thanks very much. It's been great to have you. And um, yeah, let's explore some avenues where we could maybe bring uh, bring Jen back again. That would be great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on behalf of the clinic, thanks very much for, um, yeah, for coming in and uh, doing the webinar. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks yeah. so much. And um, and you guys know how to get a hold of Jen if or uh, or read the, the look at um to uh, start practicing some of these PRT techniques because I, I think it is uh, it's yeah I think it's about as cutting edge as as pain um, therapy for chronic pain gets right now. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's um, yeah. all uh, research based tech tools tools and techniques. So thank Ooh. you so much, Jen. Absolutely. Really appreciate it, and I want to say good night to everybody, and hopefully. You can still enjoy some of this uh, beautiful evening. Yeah, absolutely. Tapping. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Absolutely. Thanks, Jen. Thanks very much. Good night. Bye. Oh, if uh, people are still here, sorry, I, I just missed. Um, that's okay that Jen mm -hmm. isn't. Uh, two questions. Is energy conservation a big part of, yes, 100% Mark, energy conservation is a big part of pain management. Absolutely. When you're tired, when you're depleted, uh, pain increases because it sends a danger signal. Sorry, we missed that. Um, pain management missing in, uh, in the hospitals. Yes, I get it. Uh, we are very fortunate where we are in Kelowna, in Salmon Arm, and in some of the other areas, Salmon Arm has a, a smaller pain clinic, uh, Vernon, Kamloops, to have pain um, clinics. Because many of you know already that when you have chronic pain, one of the last places you want to be is in, is in the emergency. Um, it's, I mean, absolutely, if you have to go, but... Um, you really want to hook into uh, a pain clinic, into a pain management center, because the hospitals often don't have the time, or you know the the education around around chronic pain. So I hope hopefully I answered those questions for Mark. Okay, everyone, take care and have a good night. <laughs>